So, today is a day for Mudita, for Maha Mudita. And as I'm sure you'll recall, the core theme here, again in the form of an aspiration, is may we all never be parted from well-being, sukha, uh, free of suffering, in other words, flawless, taintless, untinged well-being, which of course can only be eudaimonia. There's no such thing as, uh, I think there's really no such thing as hedonic pleasure that is completely free of any kind of anxiety, any unease, any restless. I don't think it exists. I'm actually very sure it doesn't exist. That's what the Buddha was referring to, and, you know, suffering of change. It feels really good, and it's still dukkha. So, there's the theme. Why couldn't all sentient beings, why couldn't we all never be parted from a sense of genuine well-being that is free, entirely free, of all the dimensions of suffering, right? Blatant suffering, suffering of change, pervasive existential suffering. So when this comes to mind, then what comes to my mind is um, may all beings find a path, reach the path, reach the path. Because only then would like, is there any chance that they're never being parted from, right? We can all have really good days, and some people may achieve shamatha and then lose it. Some people may gain insight into emptiness, and then it fades out. Have some genuine insight into rikpa, and then it becomes an object of memory, and it fades out. And this is true. These kind of similar themes are true, in fact, in all the contemplative traditions of the world. This is not just a problem for Buddhist contemplatives. And so how to bring about this irreversible flow, entering a path? So at a kind of a, a more modest level, but an enormously meaningful level, uh, within this Buddhist context, within the Mayana Buddhist context, it would be reaching, and reaching that Mayana path of accumulation with your shamatha, your vipassana, with shamatha and bodhicitta, and then fortifying it, sealing it, right, with insight into emptiness. And then it's irreversible. That second stage, remember? Gold-like bodhicitta, the type of bodhicitta, on that second stage of Mahayana path of accumulation. With, so within, the, within Buddhist context. Then, although, you know, there'll be ups and downs, so get used to that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can be well up on the path and say, it was a good day, but the day before that, not so good. You know, that's just going to continue for a long time. Uh, that's okay. But... Then you're actually on the path. You'll never, you'll never be a non-bodhisattva. You'll never be off the path. In any lifetime, you'll never be off. Right? And then you saw, if you wanted to review, what are the characteristics of actually achieving the Arya Marga, the path of the Aryas, those who have direct realization of Nirvana. So you have stream enterers in the Theravada or the Shravakayana. We have the Arya Bodhisattvas within the context of the Mayana. We have... The achievement of the yoga of freedom of, not, of freedom of conceptual elaboration on the Mahamudra path. And then we have the fully matured Vidyadatta on the Dzogchen path. You get up to there, and then you basically only have good days from then on. You know, there aren't any bad days. Uh, it is so sublime and so profound. And then you're just an occurrence, so you're going to swiftly, swiftly employing towards the culmination of the path. Now, that's all within the Buddhist context. But Buddhism has never been a, at least very rarely, extremely rarely, has it been a militant evangelical kind of tradition of going out and saying, do you believe in the Four Noble Truths? No, then off with your head. You know? It's kind of like, what? You're going to take my head for that? <laughs> what part do I need to believe in? It's kind of just totally weird, you know? And so... So what about everybody else? Are we only, are we in fact praying, may everybody become Buddhist? And shall we start, you know, good evangelical movement here? Have you found the one true way? You know, I've heard that so many times, I, I feel like, you know, projectile vomiting. Because you get it from science. You get it from Christianity. You get it from, keep on going. And you'll find Buddhists, of course, that think they have the only way. Of course you do. It's, it's human, human stuff. It's called... Um, Grasping to one's own view as supreme. And it's one of the fundamental types of delusion. <laughs> so if you're a Buddhist doing that, 
you kind of have to be embarrassed, you know, because you're embracing a root suffering, a root cause of suffering as the path to you know, helping others achieve liberation. So it's kind of silly. But what about the relevance of path for those who are not drawn to, do not have faith, confidence, trust in the Buddhist path? And the many, not only fine people, but extraordinary people, uh, who are not following the Buddhist path. There always have been, right? That's so obvious. Hardly needs to be stated. But I come back to a book that I haven't read for a long time, but I'm kind of thinking I'd like to read it again. It made it such a deep impression, impression on me about 45 years ago when I was in Germany, reading voraciously, studying Tibetan a little bit, and ready to launch, head off to India, spend 10 years there and become enlightened. That was my... That was my plan. <laughs> There's this, this Christian aphorism I told it many times. If you, want to, if you want, want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. So when the Buddhas and if you know, whatever, the divine were watching me in Germany, they'd be getting a good chuckle out of it. Like, ten years, I'm old. Long time. <laughs> You've made a big commitment. Ten years. Woo! <laughs> But I read this book towards the, the, the closing months of my nine, my nine months of relative solitude in a little flat right across from the central cathedral uh, in Göttingen. And Aljo Sakli, The Perennial Philosophy. And it really made a deep, deep impression. And as I recall, he wasn't saying something that is kind of sappy, like the little boy in uh, The Life of Pi. That, you know, like, it's, it's all one. You know, well, it's very cute, and it's also not militant. So, if you're going to err on the side of being, you know, harsh, sectarian, or kind of goofy, it's all one. Then go with the all one. Yeah, I'll join you with all one. It's much nicer. It's kind of stupid, but it's nice. You know, the other one's dangerous. Uh, no, Aldo actually was no fool. He was not a simpleton. And my sense of it, it's a 45-year-old memory. So forgive me if I'm wrong. But he, having done some scoping out of the multiple contemplative traditions of the world, f- drew the conclusion that they were converging in upon a common reality. And if my memory is correct, then my enthusiasm for that, my intuitive affirmation of that, which I felt 45 years ago, uh, continues to this day. That the great contemplative traditions of the world, their insights are converging in upon the most important dimension of reality that human beings can possibly know, or that I would say that can be known in general. And if that's the case, so that's, my, that's been my working hypothesis ever since. And if that's the case, then it immediately raises another question. Among these multiple paths, which are very different, and their starting points are very, very different, which is your path? And then, which is your path? Because to try to say, well, I'm going to be 5% Sufi and 15% Advaita Vedanta and 10% Dzogchen, but I like Theravada, so I'm going to give them 7%. You know, it's, it's again, kind of silly. It's kind of, it's, it's silly. I think His Holiness says it's like put, trying to put the, the head of a yak on the body of a sheep. <laughs> it just doesn't fit. You know, trying to just kind of be everything, you know, everything to everyone. To be, to be respectful and appreciative and to be vividly aware of the profound insights of multiple traditions that in many respects may be contrary to one's own. Oh, that's just being smart, <laughs> really. Uh, but to think they're all saying the same thing, well, cl- clearly not. But the notion that they're all converging in upon a common truth, a common reality, the tr- transcendent, the divine, the ultimate nature of reality, is something that I have been, been, my, been my working hypothesis for a very long time. And it was quite intuitive to, intuitively obvious to me when I picked up my first book on Tibetan Buddhism that Dzogchen was the one that rang the bell. And then my revered lamas then guided me in the Galupa for 20 years and a bit of Sakya, a bit of Theravada. And then I was able to complement that with Dzogchen for the last 26 years. Moving on, though, because we're, we don't want to veer too, too far away from this mudita, which is the theme for this morning, what about all the others? Because many people are simply not drawn to uh, Buddha Dharma in any of its multiple faces, Theravada, Zen, and so on and so on. And, but this, this is why I mentioned Aldo Saxley's book. And just by the way, he was, not a, uh, he was not really an academic scholar of religion, a very creative mind. Uh, read a number of works by him. 
but, uh, but two of the most outstanding, by general consensus, two, two of the most outstanding comparative, uh, scholars of a comparative religion, let's say for the latter half of the 20th century, two, two real, really stand out. And one is Houston Smith, really outstanding, and he taught for years at MIT. And the other one, and I, I knew him, we were quite good friends, He's still alive, but very old. I've not seen him for some years now. He lives right in, in Berkeley or thereabout. And the other one is Ninian Smart, and he passed away some years ago. But he taught in the Department of Religious Studies at the Univers- University of California, Santa Barbara, where I taught, and he was there when I was teaching, when I was on the faculty there. And uh, he was a Scot and an outstanding scholar. And I mentioned these two just very briefly, uh, because these two outstanding scholars of comparative religion, I mean, they're really renowned. We don't have anybody like that anymore, certainly not me. Uh, they both were very sympathetic to, or simply explicitly embraced, endorsed, this idea of the perennial philosophy of also, also, also Saxley. And they, more than anybody I, I know, were really well versed in the tremendous diversity, the range, the differences, the common grounds within Islam and Taoism and Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism and so forth. They were really consummate scholars and they wrote extensively. So it's not a silly idea. It's not just kind of a New Age idea that was popular in the 60s. And so in this regard, uh, I did a bit of poking about, pretty kind of superficial, frankly, but I think not entirely trivial, in my book, Mind in the Balance, where I am pretty familiar with the path, as we see from the Pali Canon, and how it segues into the Mahayana, and the Mahayana, including the, the teachings on emptiness, how this segues into Dzogchen, and it's just one s- smooth, continuous flow to rainbow body. I'm fairly familiar with that. Uh, but then as I was poking around, uh, looking to see if I could see anything that had kind of the scent, or something similar to Dzogchen, then I found it very, very emphatically in the Christian tradition, the Neoplatonic tradition of Christianity, culminating perhaps in, well, one of the great ones was Nicholas of Cusa in the 15th century. Brilliant man. Incredibly. Polymath. Something like Leonardo da Vinci. The man was brilliant in so many different ways. Uh, and his writings, which I was introduced to when I was on the faculty in Santa Barbara, uh, really struck me. Wow, this looked like Dzogchen. Couched in Christianity. It wasn't like he was being a heretic. In fact, he was a cardinal and he was a personal emissary of the Pope. So I think he was pretty legitimate. He wasn't up, 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 up for excommunication uh, or, you know, being condemned as a heretic and so forth. He was about as close to the Vatican as you could get. And so his writings. And then kind of an obvious one, it's a big ripe flu- fruit ready to drop into your hand, is Advaita, Advaita Vedanta. The, ad, uh, the Advaita Vedanta, Vedanta means the Veda Anta, the culmination of the Vedas, the final flowering, the climax, the the summit of the Vedas. And I think that's true. And Advaita means non-dual. And I've known this for years. There's just so many parallels. They kind of leap out, leap out at you. Uh, and then I did a p- bit of poking around. There's a very fine Matt, what is his last name? Matt, mm, tip of the tongue. He's an outstanding scholar in the Kabbalah. I'll get it later. But reading in the Kabbalah. And he's, tra- he's translating the uh, Zohar, I think it is. An enormous... Uh, Matt? Daniel. Doesn't quite ring a bell. Not quite. I'll get it. Not Daniel's. No, I would know it. I'll get it later. But he's really like first-rate scholar. But reading in the Kabbalah, and he said, whoa, when it goes to the, the Ain, A-Y-I-N, I'm like, whoa, that looks a lot like Dzogchen teachings. Uh, and then if one looks further, my strong premonition is you're going to find something very similar in the Sufi, in the Taoism, and so forth. So it really struck me that, and I'm trying to tease that name out of my mind, out of my fishing rod, probably I'm trying to point to my substrate conscious. Come on, come on. Um, I'll get it. If this is the case, if it's true, that it's not just a superficial resemblance, but in fact they are tapping into this ultimate ground, then in this mudita, the aspiration would be May people following all the great faiths, all the great traditions, wisdom traditions, not just faiths, they're wisdom traditions of the world, these religious religions, may each of them, each one of them, find their path by way of their own tradition. Not that we convert them over to Buddhism, we convert them over to some other track. In fact, the Dalai Lama is generally advised against that. 
said, I don't really want to encourage you to, to convert to Buddhism. You know, rather, if you have a tradition, then go deeper into that tradition. Right? And if you have to, well then okay, convert to Buddhism if, if there's nothing else you can do. And that's, that was my case, I had no choice. And so, so when we bring forth this mudita, this benevolent, open-minded, but you know, discerning, discerningly intelligent mudita, then the aspirin may, aspiration may be, may people of all the great contemplative traditions, religious traditions of the world, may they find the path to genuine well-being, never be parted from that, which is totally devoid of suffering. And may, find, may they find the path within their own tradition, where they're at home, and come to that culmination. That's good. Then there's no coercion, there's no manipulation, no kind of agenda of trying to get you over to my side. That's for religion. But then I was, as I was doing this research for Mind in the Violence, I continued my studies of physics and finding, and you've seen it, from Thomas Hertog, from Paul Davies, and John Seininger, John Wheeler, Andre Linde, it seems the station, this statements coming out of the, let's say, the quantum, quantum physics Mm. you know, anta, the con- or the physics anta, let's call it physics anta, at least for the time being, perhaps, it's my, it's my intuition, thus far the culmination of physics, physics anta, the cultivation of fi- culmination of physics, where it's coming to quantum cosmology, and you read the statements there, and you say, God, this looks an awful lot like Dzogchen, but not from a religious perspective at all. It's pure science, and in fact, it's coming from a materialistic basis. The 19th century physicists were pretty much materialists, it came out of that. The earlier ones weren't. Galileo, forget it, but they were all Christian. 19th century, more, you know, more secular, more secular. 20th century, more secular. 20th century, very secular. Quantum cosmology is coming out of the 20th century. That's the most materialistic century we've ever had. And there it is, and it's so profoundly non-materialistic. You know, whether they're suggesting the role of the observer is indispensable for the universe to be here and to evolve. Boy, is that not materialistic. They shattered it. They torpedoed it. They nuked materialism. And by the people who know the most about matter, who knows more about matter than people who are, you know, really have the most proficient knowledge of quantum mechanics? Because right down to the very nature of the basic constituents of the physical world. Whereas with, among, the, among the sciences, the, those scientists who have the least understanding of matter, because they just don't need to have a profound, are neuroscientists and psychologists. And they tend to be most, the most materialistic. That's a wonderful irony. Those with the least understanding have the greatest faith in 19th century physics, 19th century mechanistic materialism. So we really, as, as uh, what's his name, Donald Hoffman, is pleading to his fellow cognitive scientists, catch up, you know, don't stay behind in the late 19th century. I mean, they're all dead, you know. Come into the 21st century and look at the physics that is relevant now, which is completely repudiated, the notion of matter that you people still have. Wake up, for heaven's sake. It's the 21st century. You missed a whole century of physics. So if you're going to be a materialist, at least be smart about it. You know, don't, don't rely on physics that's been dead for 100 years. And so out of physics, out of this scientific stream, if physicists, the cutting-edge physicists going into this field, who are looking at the role of the observer in nature, if they would learn how to take these insights and be able to put to put to the test by deeply investigating what is the nature of the observer, because they're saying the observer participant is essential for reality, then wouldn't you want to know about what's the nature of the observer participant and not just know more about atoms and space, time, matter, energy? And so if they could have a path, then science itself could become a path. Right out of science, without having to be Buddhist or Christian or theistic or non-theistic, you could just have science as your path if you introduced the elements such as shamatha vipassana in a way that was absolutely, uh, absolutely compatible with, well, frankly, I think it already is, what part of shamatha you know, is unscientific. And in types of vipassana we've been looking at, what part just requires some silly leap of faith you know, and trashing your intellect and so forth? I don't see anything at all. Whether you're following Tsongkhapa, whether you're following Kamachame, whether you're following Dushyam Nimba, say, but this, is, but this is brilliant. And so physics science itself could become a path to awakening if they would embrace theories which they don't have, no, methods which they don't have, but which are completely compatible 
with the scientific worldview and more profoundly consonant with the implications of quantum cosmology than anything else around. So may all the scientists never be parted from genuine happiness free of suffering and following their own path. They don't need to hop out of the scientific boat and hop into a, a Buddhist boat. Stay in your scientific boat, but enrich it. We need, you, don't, you need an engine. We'll give you an engine of Shamsi Vipassana so you can start sailing across the ocean of samsara and not just exploring it. Right? And then we have philosophy. You know. Dear philosophy. <laughs> Science started out as philosophy. They, until 19th century, people who were doing what we call practicing science, they called practicing natural philosophy. Until the 19th century. Then the, the term, about mid-19th century, the term science was invented. It caught on. And then suddenly it was something you could be very proud to be. Thomas Huxley and so forth, he introduced. You know, now we're better than everybody else. We know more than any of those silly religious people. Uh, but William James, my beloved William James, he has some very good insight here. It's very short. Just one quote for this morning. All about Mudita, by the way. And he writes that the extraordinary progress of science since, since 1600, that's Galileo, and that, in quotes, is due to a rather sudden finding of the way in which a certain order of questions ought to be attacked, questions admitting of mathematical treatment. In other words, what Galileo did was he found a path. He found a path for the kind of questions they were pursuing. Copernicus came up with a brilliant theory and had no way of testing it. You know, the heliocentric. He came up with that, mathematically formulated it. But then they just debated back and forth, like medieval scholastics, which is what they were. But there was no re resolution in sight. They could be debating even now if sudden, some, somebody hadn't come along and found a way to put Copernicus' theory to the test of experience and with the reinforcement of mathematics. And lo and behold, that man was born about 45 minutes from here. Galileo in Pisa. And that's where he was educated, and that's where he had his first academic position. The scientific, uh, scientific revolution started just, just across the way. Right? And so that's what Galileo did, and then Kepler did, and then, you know, over time, then Newton did, and Lavoisier did, and Darwin did, and on it goes, right into the present day. It was a rather sudden finding of the way, and that rather sudden finding wasn't Copernicus. Because they just debated and debated. Some people like the heliocentric better, some people like the geocentric better. But Galileo find a way, a certain order of questions, the way in which a certain order of questions ought to be attacked. Ever heard that one before? And that is, gosh, my mind is so, so agitated. What can I do? Well, hmm, why don't you relax first? And then you might go for stability. And then you might go for clarity. Yeah, but I'm still suffering, I'm still suffering. But then you might go for Vipassana. Oh, you know, it's a certain order of addressing the issues to be, if you like the military metaphor, I do, attacked. My mind is swarming with mental afflictions. But it's not enough to go boo-hoo or I don't like it or please stop. You need a sequence. Okay, how's your strategy? Yes, they are, they're besieging you. They're, mar they're marauders. They're raping and pillaging. They're bringing, wreaking havoc in your mind, your life, your relationships, and so forth. And they are doing it for the whole human population. But it's not enough to say, boy, we've got a problem here. It's what's your strategy? What's the, the sequence of the order? Well, the order, the certain order of questions that ought to be attacked. And so, but then he concludes with this statement, which I've remembered for a long time. The uh, problems of philosophy. So he's defining a discipline here. And a discipline in which he made major contributions. Philosophy. Uh, radical empiricism and pragmatism. He made major contributions to both of these kind of schools or avenues of philosophy. So he was no outsider. The problems of philosophy are those that have not yet been solved by science. Indeed, the domain of philosophy may be partially defined by that criterion. In other words, when you have a problem and you don't have a solution for it, like yeah, they had a problem back in the 16th century. Does the earth go around the sun or the sun go around the earth? Well, some people say this and some people say that. It's philosophy. It's philosophy. And then they debate back and forth and back and forth.
and forth, and it's largely a matter of personal predilection. And for the moment, what you attend to is reality. People attend to different things, and then they take different philosophical positions, and then they go by, uh-huh, uh-uh, uh-huh, uh-uh. That's a history of philosophy, in a nutshell, if you'd like to know that. I just kind of wrapped it up from, you know, the uh-huh, uh-uh, from Plato and Aristotle to the present. I think it was Bertrand Russell that said, all of Western philosophy consists of footnotes to Aristotle and Plato. Introspectionists, like me, go for Plato. Extrospectionists think Aristotle's great. And then, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. <laughs> like two cooing pigeons. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so what he's saying about is you, have a, you can have a philosophy of X until you actually know it, until you actually gain insight, until you have knowledge. Until you have knowledge of X, you have philosophy of X. That's what he's saying. And natural, that is, and a branch of philosophy was called natural philosophy until they started, unlike all other branches of philosophy, coming up with an a, a ever-growing body of consensual knowledge that they tested with empirical means that gave rise to results that were evident to all the educated, knowledgeable people. And now we have, we don't have a science of animals, we don't have a philosophy of animals. We don't have a philosophy of cells. We don't have a philosophy of atoms. We don't have a philosophy of galaxies. We don't have a philosophy of brain, right? Because we know about that stuff. We, the scientific community, knows about that stuff. They used to have a philosophy of the earth and the sun, which goes around which. That was before Galileo. And then Galileo, finding the, the phases of Venus, terminated the philosophy of the heavens, because he found empirical means. He found strategy. This is one of Galileo's brilliances. He didn't tackle questions that were over his pay grade, that were beyond his scope. He tackled simple questions. If you drop, drop a big heavy thing and a light thing off the Tower of Pisa, does a heavy thing, as we would imagine, hit much faster than the, than the little light thing, which Aristotle said yes. And all you needed was a heavy thing and a small thing in the Tower of Pisa and you could refute Aristotle. That's how difficult that was. For like 2,000 years, they thought the heavy thing would come down faster. Nobody thought to go, you know, find a leaning tower. You could probably do it without a leaning tower. <laughs> but the tower is so inviting. I've been up on it. And it's like, whoa, it's really leaning, you know? And that refuted 2,000 years of unquestioned belief. And then he didn't have to have very sophisticated technology. Here's a simple question. Roll two balls down a ramp, or roll a ball down a ramp, just one ball. Does it accelerate or go at constant velocity? Simple question. It was so simple that he could answer it and come up with a definite, definitive conclusion that nobody's really doubted ever since. But Aristotle said they go at the same speed. They don't accelerate. All he needed was a good clock and a ball. <laughs> a chronometer, you know? So that was his brilliance. He tackled tackleable problems. He found a path. That's what Galileo did. He found a path. You can build on that. Do all of the, the celestial bodies, do they all go around the Earth? Well, no. It took him one week to see that the moons of Jupiter go around Jupiter. Done. There's no philosophy of that. There's no philosophy of Jupiter. So, would you like me to mention a philosophy? Because now we know when we say philosophy, it's a philosophy we don't know about. It's a philosophy of no consensual knowledge. There's philosophy of religion. I've studied it. All kinds of different views. There's a philosophy of many things. There's a philosophy of philosophy of science. Oh, I know. There's a philosophy of mind. It's still alive and well, and people are making a living at it, which means they still don't know what they're talking about. Because if they did, there would be no philosophy of mind. It would only be psychology, cognitive science. If you want an indication of this, look in the New York Times today, the last couple of days, there's an article right there by a philosopher named Strawson that says, you know, consciousness, mind, it's, it's matter. We just haven't figured out, we haven't explored matter deeply enough. Matter's mysterious. We've had 400 years, but we need a bit more time. And then we'll figure out how it is that matter can become conscious or is conscious. Like, I call those materialism of the gaps. That they've had 400 years, for heaven's sakes. If you still haven't figured out how matter could possibly become conscious from its own material constituents, 
What do you want, another millennium? In the meantime, we're just supposed to have faith because that's exactly what he's saying. O ye of little faith, if you're giving up in materialism, no mysterious are the ways of matter. <laughs> we just need to understand it more deeply. And then, it will, then we will prove our beliefs to be true. That in fact, yes, consciousness emerges from matter. We just don't know enough about matter yet. I find that hilarious. And of course, in the New York Times and the other one <laughs> across, the, across the way, my, my dear Michael Graziano, or Michael Graziano saying, oh, no problem about consciousness. It doesn't exist at all. It doesn't exist at all. I like that very much. It, it solves the problem, yet you don't think about it anymore. <laughs> I mean, these people are desperate. They're desperate. They'll do anything to get rid of the problem of consciousness. Oh, ye of little faith, just give us more time. Oh, ye little faith, just never mind. You're not conscious. You don't have a mind. And oh, there are no appearances either. I think we've solved the problem. Because we've all buried our head in the sands of mm, scientific materialism. There's another article right now in the, center of the Atlantic Monthly by one more scientist saying, there's no such thing as free will. Free will doesn't exist. But it'd be good if you believed in it anyway. Gosh. They can't even live by their own convictions. Can't even live by their own convictions. They want to tell us what's really going on, as if they knew. But they say, you know, it's better for you if you believe in reincarnation. If you believe in, yeah, reincarnation. If you <laughs> believe in free will, it'd be much better for you if you do. Because you won't like feeling that you're an automaton. But of course you are. You know, jeez. Such intellectual hypocrisy staggers the imagination that even they are not willing to live by what they say they believe. Okay, may they all be free. May they all find <laughs> genuine happiness, never be parted from genuine happiness. Listen to the people in Quantum Cosmology, follow the breadcrumbs, and you'll find that consciousness is more than nothing or more than an emergent property of, of matter. So, one more point. Two hours ago, I didn't have any idea what I'd talk about this morning. And then, blah, 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 blah. My mind just chattered away. So it chatters some more. Path, right? So crucial. If this, if this aspiration, may we all never be parted from, that means you've got to have path. A path, right? On the other hand, some of us are getting a bit old, like Elizabeth and me. And we're getting kind of old. Time is running out. Mary Kay will get a little bit old. <laughs> David doesn't look like any whippersnapper to me. He doesn't even have much hair. You know. That's a definite sign. You know, getting old. So we hear about path, 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 and the older we get, kind of like it seems like it's receding over the over the event horizon. Like. <sighs> <laughs> I wish I could have lasted longer. <laughs> so then it seems like, oh, okay, all of this, all of this drum roll about path, and yet we're getting old. We don't even don't even have one property, you know, where we can just have nurture people, take care of people, pay for people if they need it, just to hunker down and, you know, revolutionize the world. But then, as we'll see in the coming coming couple of days, from Kamachamit. This extraordinary Dzogchen master, Mahamudra master, scholar, adept. He ends on the note, which he ends, he ended in also space of path of freedom, of pure light. Pure light. Sukhavati. And if you want to read ahead, you'll see, hey, you don't have to be an Arya Bodhisattva, you don't have to have achieved shamatha or realization of emptiness, you don't have to have impeccable bodhicitta, and so forth and so on. It's really a matter of some basic things, of keeping pure ethics, arousing bodhicitta, dedicating merit, dedic devoting yourself to the path, and then above all, so, you know, be a genuine Dharma practitioner. Don't treat, treat this as something cheap. Devote yourself to Dharma, but whether or not you achieve this, or that, or the other thing on stages of the path, or stages leading to the path, just make prayers to Amitabha. Make prayers and dedicate, prayers of dedication, that all of your virtue may lead to your own uh, upon your death, taking birth in pure land of Sukhavati, the very, the, yeah, Sukhavati, the joyful, Dewachin. And then he describes once you're there, well, you're set, you're set. And that is from there on, you just, you just have this, 
you found like the perfect retreat center in the whole universe. And it's created by the mind of Amitabha. And he blessed it with his prayers that anyone who directed their faith to him and their prayers to him, by his power, the power by the power of his blessings, one may take birth in the Sukhavati. And then, really, you've got no more worries. It's not a deva realm. It's not just a, ple- a pleasure palace. In fact, it's, it's just all about dharma. It's all about dharma. And from there, if you wish to, you can go to other, other pure lands. You can go to Shambhala, for example, or different, different other pure lands. Shambhala is actually a human realm. It's an anomaly, but very much a pure land as well. But in any case, you're set, you're set for eternity. Take birth in a pure land. So that comes as an enormous relief. And he did save it until the end. He didn't put that in the first chapter. First chapter, he said, roll up your sleeves. Get to, get to work. <laughs> Preliminary practices, shamato or bust. The pashana, don't be a deluded fool. You know, and carry on, carry on. And then at the very end, just before you're about to die, he says, well, it's a cup of tea. And so, so then we can pray, may all beings be born of Sukhavati. Because then that, that will fulfill the dream, fulfill that aspiration. Be born in a pure realm. Then, there's no, read for you, no, no reason for you ever to be parted from genuine happiness, free, totally free of sorrow. But if that's the case, then what do we need to be here for in a retreat? And having ups and downs and upheavals and bad days and headaches and nausea and energy surges and bliss and misery. and What do you need to do this? Why couldn't you just stay home and just pray to be born in Sukhavati? Why not that? You know. And the answer is, he could. Nobody needs to be here. Could. Now, it's not just you know, a free lunch. It is by the power of the blessing, the grace of Buddha Amitabha, the Buddha of infinite light. And it does call, as, as Kamachan that says in one of the kind of a subsidiary text, okay, what, but what do you need to do from your side? And he lays it out in great detail. And it really is lead an, an ethical life, bodhicitta. Devote yourself to the cultivation of the perfections. Uh, do dedicate your prayers to, to uh, birth and sakabhati. So it really is calling up and people have an extraordinary devotion to dharma. And then it's the grace note there. Literally the grace note is, and now dedicate the merit to be born in sakabhati. But then why trouble ourselves with all the effort of you know, creating a contemplative observatory and so forth, if we can all just be really good Dharma practitioners, you know? And, I mean, really good, and I mean genuine, no lip service, no, nothing trivial about this, but very dedicated, dedicate merit, and be born in Sukhavati. Mm-hmm. And I have an answer for that. For one's own sake, we have Ramdhan and Jendra, Sva'artha, Para'artha, one's own well-being and the well-being of others. For one's own well-being, that's enough. Live a virtuous life, an ethical life, a benevolent life, a life that is all oriented around bodhicitta. Dedicate merit. All your aspirations can be filled that way. Really. I have that faith. I have that faith. I mean, these are, you know, this this is Kamachana. This is the Buddha himself in the Mayana Sutras. This is Holiness Dalai Lama. This is Tsongkhapa. This is, you know, these are the greatest of the greats who are affirming this within the whole Mayana tradition. So, if I didn't have faith in that, then I wouldn't have faith in Mayana. I'd say, you know, whatever. So for oneself, that's quite sufficient, actually. Unless one, like myself, wishes to make this life as meaningful as possible. In which case, just leading, leading a, a generally virtuous life and being a good person and, and so forth is not the greatest possible meaning. So in that regard, for myself, now I want to do what I want I'm doing. I wouldn't take back anything for the last 45 years. Because this is the most meaningful path that I can find. So no regrets, no matter what happens in the future. I want this life to be as, much, as meaningful as possible. And therefore, it's not just counting on my life insurance program of rebirth and sukhapati. But for many people, it is sufficient. And I have absolutely no criticism of that at all. But then there's para-artha, the well-being of others. The well-being of others. So let's imagine that, I mean, there's whole schools, of, there's one school of Buddhism, I, I met somebody in that school, 
Pure Land School of Chinese Buddhism. I knew him when I was in Switzerland. He was a European man. Uh, but that was his path. And he, and he said, from our tradition, uh, he said, we don't meditate because meditating would be kind of a suggestion or impl- implying that we don't really trust Amitabha. That we still feel we have to earn our way. So therefore we don't meditate. We just live ethical lives, benevolent lives. And then we just do devotions and prayers and devotions and prayers. Uh, so it was basically, in his view, it was Christianity without the Creator. That's what he said. Because I can't handle the notion of Creator God. It makes no sense to me at all. But I like the notion of heaven. Uh, I like... And so I just want Christianity without God. Take out God, put in Amitabha, and I'm happy because Amitabha is not the creator of the universe. Um, So no meditation for him because it's just not needed and in fact suggests you don't really trust in the grace of the blessings of Amitabha. So imagine that we, we Buddhists then kind of slipped over to that side that, well, after all, we're taken care of, you know, so... The world's going down, it's terribly gener- degenerate and all of that. But you know, I have faith, and so I can be born as a cup of tea and so, like that. But then all the power of the Four Noble Truths, the Three Principles of the Path, Shamatha Vipassana, the Three Higher Trainings, the Six Perfections, the Majamaka, the Mahamudra, the Dzogchen, the six, six Dharmas of Naropa, and the list goes on and on and on. Just all put into the closet, into deep storage. Say, we don't really need that, all we need is Amitabha. So all this tremendous, inconceivable wealth of knowledge, of wisdom, and so forth. Oh, we don't need that. We're taken care of. We'll just be born as a I wonder what really what Amitabha would think of that if we put everything else in the closet and just said, no, all we want is you. We just like what you, we like your offer. We'll take you up in that offer. Thanks so much. But it's more than that. And I feel this very passionately that right now there's only one widely accepted paradigm or range of methodologies for which there's a not universal but broad degree of consensus among educated people throughout the world of the way to know reality. There is one. It's science, obviously. And they're so good at what they do. And they're so good at what they do that in the minds of many people, like the Politburo in in communist China, uh, U.S. government is basically run, the policies are basically run on this, that science is the only way. All of the grant money, it always goes to science. Uh, You know, it never goes to contemplative inquiry. You know, no science, 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 science. And what are scientists good good at looking at? Well, they're, number one, looking outwards, not inwards. They're very good at looking at and understanding the objective, physical, and quantifiable. And they've been terrifically successful. And who can fault fault them for that? But if those who have at their fingertips a path of contemplative inquiry that yields direct insight, replicable, intersubjectively verifiable insights in the nature of reality, and we sit back on our hands, and just pray to be born in Sukhavati. Then we've left the table. Philosophers have demonstrated over 2,000 years they're not coming up with any consensual knowledge at all. The religions of the world, as religious institutions, have made it perfectly obvious, from the Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, and so forth, they're, not nowhere, they're nowhere coming anywhere near approaching or even trying to approach some consensual knowledge. They're just trying to get converts. The Muslims converting, the Christians converting, Jewish pretty happy with themselves, you know, and so forth. But there's just, there's just no suggestion that they're going to converge, or they're even trying to come to conceptual knowledge. The theme of Otto Hakli, that's not exact, exactly mainstream Christianity, or mainstream Buddhism, or mainstream anything else, except for life of Pi. It's, a lot, it's mainstream life of Pi. You know. And so, if the contemplatives leave the stage, we have left the stage with only one show in town. There is only one way to truth. And that's the way of science. And science, since Thomas Huxley, has been absolutely wed, fused with materialism. And that's just enough to make me cry all year. But then if you accept science, you have to accept scientific materialism. And I can't even really imagine a worldview more bleak than that. 
more desperate than that, more blind than that. And we're leaving the stage and saying, well, take over, you guys. I know a neuroscientist, you will not know who I'm referring to, so I'll just continue. It's not any of the big names you know. And uh, very sweet man, very ethical man, very good neuroscientist. And he commented to me once, knowing, you know, he had a lot of contact with me and the people I know. And they said, oh, Alan, when it comes to consciousness, I enjoy the mystery. He was acknowledging that the scientific community just doesn't understand consciousness. They don't have a clue. They can't define it. They can't measure it. They don't know what causes it. They really haven't answered any of the questions, the big question about nature of consciousness or the mind-body relationship, as Donald Hoffman's made so clear. There's been no progress since Thomas Huxley and exactly what is the relationship between mind, mind, brain, mind and brain. No progress at all for all of the insights they have found. So my friend just said, it comes to consciousness and I enjoy the mystery. And what he's saying, here speaking to me is, you know, not that I'm any authority, but I know a lot of, you know, I know a lot of Buddhists, that the implication is perfectly obvious. You people don't know anything, of course, but we don't. And therefore, since we don't, it's a mystery. But I enjoy the mystery. You know, I could have spoke to him for a thousand hours about the insights gained. A thousand hours. And you know me, I probably could. <laughs> a thousand hours. Just give me some water. You know, I keep myself pumped up. I can do it. I didn't know I can do it. I can be the little engine that could. I could sit him down for a thousand hours and talk about the insights and the nature of consciousness by the Buddha, by Nagasena, by Buddha Gosa, by Nagarjuna, by Buddha Bali, to Dharma Kirti, Tsongga by Shanti Deva, Shanti by Maitripa, Mapa Milarepa, Gampopa. I can just, I can steamroller him with people who have unveiled the mystery. Demba Tom de Sangwaten. Of achieving, having achieved stability, let the mystery be revealed. That's a tisha. It's not a mystery anymore. Unless your mind is closed to any discipline outside your own. And that's exactly true of my friend. Nobody else knows anything besides the scientists. But you Buddhists have a lot of good hunches, and we really like you a lot because you're so sweet. <laughs> and man, do your left prefrontal cortex is really buzz away. You must be really happy. And you've got a lot of gamma, whatever that means. You want to come and let us do some more, more experiments on your brains? Because we really like you people. But they never listen to what we might have to contribute in terms of our insights. They study people practicing Vipassana and, and never ask what insights they have. Oh, your, 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 stre- your, your stress is greatly alleviated. Oh, this has this health benefits. Oh, they're good for depression. Oh, they manage to trivialize the apex of Buddhist meditation into something that's good for your physical health. They trivialize Dumo, which is designed, of course, to manifest the indwelling mind of clear light, Rikpa. said, whoa, you people can really generate a lot of heat. They turned it into a thermometer exercise. Their ability to trivialize a Buddhist tradition staggers imagination. The same fellow, when he encountered one of my students, who expressed her faith in Sukhavati, and, and this neuroscientist friend of mine, he said, oh, Jane Doe, she believes in Sukhavati, and he rolled his eyes, she believes in pure lands, Jeez. as if he knew perfectly well, that's just like Santa Claus Village, as if he knew what he was talking about. He rolled his eyes in contempt that this woman believed in pure lands, as if he actually knew better than she. It made me very sad. Because it's ignorance and pomposity, the great union of ignorance and pomposity. If they're bad bedfellows. If you're going to be arrogant, at least know something. If you're going to be ignorant, at least be humble. But to be ignorant and arrogant in the same breath is really quite tragic. And this is a good man, and he's a very good scientist. But when it comes to the mind, I just I despair. If all the Buddhists who have access to these incredible wisdom, wisdom teachings, if we get complacent about the path and all of that, and say, well, after all, I'm taken care of, you're taken care of, you believe, you don't, yeah, you're, you're taken care of, then their voices dominate the sound wave. There's only one path to truth, and we have it, and it's saturated by materialism. And what could be sadder than that? That we have the ability to rise up as friends 
Because if I have a good friend who's really deluded, the best friend I can possibly be to that person is help that person come out of his or her delusion. Right? If a person is a heavy smoker and has never heard, back in the 50s, doctors, nurses, all kinds of people were smoking, chain smoking, having no idea that it was, you know, any, any problem with it. And that was true until the 60s, I think. Right? So we had millions of people dying from this, but they hadn't quite turned on the light yet. If you have a friend that's a heavy smoker, starting to develop a bit of a cough. Well, what kind of a friend would you be if you say, well, you know, I hope you enjoy your cigarettes, because I don't smoke. What kind of a friend is that? So if people have insight in the nature of mind by way of contemplative practice, if we just look at these people and we just kind of smile, oh, well, you've got your reality, I've got mine, that just seems like, frank, like frankly, anti-compassion. Where you actually know something that could help these people. And all you need is skillful means to turn the light on. So for religions, for science, for philosophy, and for all of those who don't really care about any of those, but simply want to find happiness, may we all never be parted from happiness free of suffering. There's so much possibility when he says, why couldn't? I'm going to end on this note. But why couldn't? Why couldn't all beings never be parted from such happiness, free of suffering? So here we are in this lovely spot in Tuscany. And what is desperately needed, urgently needed, if it's not day after tomorrow, let it be the day after that, a revolution in the mind science is the first one. And that's what I'm going to be speaking about at the University of Pisa tomorrow. They have to, no, tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow, Thursday, where Galileo taught, where Galileo was educated. And I'm going to talk to them about following Galileo and the need for a true revolution in the mind sciences. And they've asked me to do it. I'm not going to surprise them. They've already seen my PowerPoints, and they still invited me. <laughs> you didn't know what you're asking for, maybe, but I'm going to deliver on all those PowerPoints. You see this 18-inch hole? That's the end of a cannon. Look closely. <laughs> Say cheese. <laughs> so peace is right here. And what better place to catalyze the first true revolution in the mind sciences than in the home of Galileo? And I feel this is desperately needed. And it must be a collaborative event. It's not religion versus science. It's open-mindedness versus closed-mindedness. And there's plenty on both sides of the fence. Closed-minded religion, religious people, we say in America, dime a dozen. Closed-minded scientist, dime a dozen. Many people are. They're not so interesting. They deserve happiness, but they're not interesting to talk to. And I don't. But anybody who's open-minded, then let's talk. I'll be open. I'll do my best. I'll be open-minded. So we have there Pisa, home of the scientific revolution. Then, a stone's throw in the other direction, is Firenze, Florence, home of the Renaissance. How about that? We're in the right, we're in the right neighborhood. Home of the Renaissance, right? Florence. This is Florence. This is Michelangelo. This is Leonardo da Vinci. This is Florence. It's an easy drive from here. It's about an hour and 20 minutes. Home of the Renaissance. Well, as desperately as we are in need of a revolution in the mind sciences, I believe equally we're in desperate need of a renaissance of contemplative inquiry in the world's religions, all of them. They have, them, they have, they have their resources. They don't have to become 30% you know, Buddhist and 70% Muslim. Be 100% Muslim, be 100% Taoist, 100%, 100%. You've got it. If you know where to look, many people don't even know where to look. But there's, for example, Martin Laird, outstanding scholar, and he's, he's of Augustinian order, teaching at a major university. He's done outstanding work, research. In the, in, in like, a, like a tertun, he's like a treasure revealer within the Christian tradition. When I wrote my book, Mind and the Balance, I drew very heavily from him. You find mindfulness of breathing, you find settling the mind its natural state, you find awareness of awareness. And then you find things very remnant of some Dzogchen, and entirely Christian. There was no reference to any non-Christian religion in the whole book, as I recall. Into the Silent Land, you know. 
And so they're there. If you know where to look in Taoism, in the Sufi tradition, in the Hindu tradition, of course, in the Kabbalah, Daniel Matt. Daniel Matt. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Yep. Good. So we just had to get our act together. (laughs) Daniel Matt, outstanding scholar. And I just, I'm rambling. We're going to start, obviously, going to go late today. But um, he gave a talk at UC Santa Barbara, my my, university where I taught for four years. He gave a talk on the Kabbalah and modern physics. And when I heard that, it was part of a series in which I gave a lecture too earlier. But when I heard that, it was kind of like part of me cringed, like, oh man, it's going to be so new age, I won't be able to stand it. You know, because it's so easy. Quantum mechanics and the fairy godmother, quantum, you know, it's, I mean, people come up with this, so many goofy ideas. It just drives the physicists crazy. Because they think quantum mechanics is just a, you know, a bullshit fest. Just say anything you like, but quantum mechanics is, you know. Uh, and so I thought, oh boy, Kabbalah and quantum mechanics. Oh. And then I listened to him. He nailed it. Brilliant. Really brilliant. I know he knows his Kabbalah. He's world famous. But I'm very critical when it comes to, to physics. I mean, I've got my bullshit antenna up. <laughs> he just went right through. It was just really outstanding. I have the link for it. He's really, really good. So a renaissance in contemplative inquiry and in Judaism, Buddhism, and so forth and so on. There's the home of the Renaissance right over there. So within you know, two vectors, home of the scientific revolution, home of the Renaissance. First revolution in the mind sciences, please, a renaissance, renaissance of contemplative inquiry, please, and make it snappy so that all beings may never be parted from genuine happiness free of sorrow. And a key ingredient, you're going to just slap your head and, and groan when I say that. <laughs> For any of these to be a path, whether your path is secular, and it's coming straight from science and into quantum, quantum cosmology, you need to explore the nature of mind. I mean, duh. You need to explore the nature of the observer. Duh. But you must do so with continuity, with relaxation, stability, clarity. The physicists need to achieve shamatha. They don't have to be any less physicists to achieve shamatha. There's no dogma involved. There's no belief system involved. It's pure technology, right? And then they'd be introduced to vipassana. The Christians, they need to be introduced to shamatha. And they can draw from their own sources. They just don't know where they are unless they're Martin Laird. The Christians need, the Christian can tell, they need to achieve shamatha. Not just mess around with it for a month, like so many Buddhists do. The Hindus invented shamatha, but they're not doing it much. They're really not doing it much. It's mostly puja, puja, puja. You know. And the Taoists, they've got shamatha, but they need to start achieving it, practicing it, and so forth, all of them. They need to do that and then get into gear with your own tradition, but with muscle, you know, with stability and continuity, with clarity. Philosophers... They've been thinking about the mind for 2,000 years, for heaven's sake. Still have no consensus at all on anything. Philosophers, you know, why don't you have a natural philosophy of the mind? Take a, t- take a hint from Galileo, start looking at it, for heaven's sake. But don't do it with folk psychology. Don't do it with folk introspection. You're professionals. You've had 8, 10 years of training as philosophers. Now compound that with 10 years of training in shamatha. So you can terminate philosophy of mind. Make it dead as a doornail. As they used to have in the 19th century, philosophy of atoms. In the 19th century, philosophy of atoms. Chemists had one view and physicists had another view and they baited back and forth, back and forth, philosophy of atoms. Until Rutherford and Thompson and so forth and came along, they had the good technology, they found questions they could ask. There's no such thing as a philosophy of atoms anymore. It's science. It's atomic physics. There's no philosophy, it's a joke. I would like to see in my lifetime that the notion of philosophy of mind becomes a joke. Anyone with philosophy of cells, philosophy of brain, philosophy of gallbladder. When you know about something, then it's not a philosophy of it anymore, it's the science of it. So to bring this very briefly, fully into the 21st century, just kind of the global landscape. As far as I can tell, there are two, relevant to what I spoke about this morning, there are two 
major, powerful, enormous movements that are on the rise. And one of these is religious fundamentalism. Uh, for example, it's only one, of, one example, but it's a very big one, fundamentalist Islam, rapidly growing all over the world, east and west, Africa, Asia, North America, Europe. It's, uh, it's a growth industry. In America, and not confined to America, religious fundamentalism is very, very healthy, very, very robust. More than 40% of Americans believe in the literal reading of the book of Genesis, that the universe really was created 8,000 years ago, and it took six days. They just look at science and they just say, screw that. Just like, whatever. You know, there's no interest. And so scientists wring their hands, American scientists especially, wring their hands. Why is the American public so scientifically illiterate? And it's really, if you see the statistics, it's kind of like, really? I mean, really illiterate. And that's 40%. I mean, that's, they're voting for Trump, you know. That's how illiterate. Sometimes I will use a name. When I see a real danger, I think there's a real danger there. Where is this coming from? Because religious fundamentalists, almost by definition, are militant. They've demonstrated countless times throughout history. And why? Because they all think they have the only way. And they think everybody else's way is worth nothing or is diabolical in nature. That's standard. It's been going on for centuries. And what do they do? Dominate, convert, kill, or convert. That's, that's the, the four options. When you see somebody else following not your path, kill them, dominate them, convert them. Or the third option? I think that's pretty much it. And they've been doing it for centuries. That's why... For non-religious people, they look at religion and say, it's just such a big toxic barrel. I mean, they've just been fighting. Until they kind of open their eyes and say, well, how about the century in which scientific materialism became very dominant? Oh, there were no bigger murderers than Mao Zedong. He killed 40 million of his own people. And waged war against all religions. Genocide, not just a bit. All over China. Taoism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam. The most savage religious wars in history were waged by non-religious people. They're atheists. Stalin, 20 million of his own people killed. Warfare against all religions in the Soviet Union. They don't, you know, all the religions, they don't hold a candle to what Stalin and Mao Zedong did. They pale in comparison. You know. Scientific materialism is on the rise. It's on the rise. Less and less just ordinary churchgoers just bailing out of becoming indifferent towards religion and then kind of siding with the New York Times, Scientific and Atlantic Monthly, kind of what they're getting from the media and what they're getting from the public policy. Well, after all, there's, there is only one way. It's science. And the, the, the scientists with the microphones, because 40% of scientists in America believe in God who responds to prayer. They never get the microphone. You wouldn't even know they're there unless you know where to look for the polls. And that number hasn't changed for the last century. But all the scientists who get the microphone, ah, they're all singing the song of you know, materialism. That we're basically just robots. I mean, that's the implication. If they just follow the, you know, just follow the implications, what they say they believe, but they're not willing to live by. So these two are really on the rise. And then you look at it and say, you know, there's not, no accident there. I asked a man who's done a lot of research into the rise of fanatical Islam, the ISIS, the Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, the Boko Haram. I mean, it's like, whoa, what's going on here? Because Islam does have quite a militant history, but not crazy militant like this. Of this, you know, those Buddha statues in Pakistan, they were there for 1,500 years. They were defaced, but they didn't even feel they needed to blow them up. The Taliban can't even see defaced Buddha images. And the ISIS can't even stand seeing culture, like Greek culture. They'll blow that up too. That Greek culture, those, you know, those ancient monuments, they've been around for 2,500 years. But only the ISIS felt they had to blow them up. So something fresh is happening here. Not just ordinary religious intolerance. Something is really up. It's really toxic. And it's not just Muslims. It's religious fundamentalism. And it's, it's, you find it in Hinduism. You find it in Christianity. You find it in Judaism. You pretty much find it everywhere. And it's militant, it's harsh, it's merciless, self-righteous, and ready to go to war. Just as the atheists have demonstrated their very happy willing, willingness to stamp out religion wherever they see it and kill the religious people in the process. No problemo. 
So I see these two on the rise. Well, lo and behold, it's not accident. I check with this man who's done a lot of research on it. I said, what are people like ISIS? What are they so pissed off at? Because they're so angry. They just want to blow up women and children, just anybody. What are they angry at? As long as it's us. But of course, if they're not us, then they blow up each other. You know, I mean, the, as one, one very well-informed commentator said, this Muslim radicalism, they're killing far, far, far more Muslims than they are non-Muslims because they're easier targets. In the homeland, you, you can kill them in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan and Afghanistan and Iraq and so forth. They're easier targets. Women and children everywhere, just blow them up in your backyard rather than driving to New York. It's much harder. Right? What are they angry at? And this, this man who's done a lot of research on this, he said, they're angry at modernity. They can't stand modernity. They see modernity and they say, no, true Islam is what Muhammad taught 1400 years ago. And we need to go back to the good old days when women knew their place and everybody really followed the words of Muhammad. You know. And the Christian fundamentalists, the same. And Buddhist fundamentalists, the same. And Hindu fundamentalists, the same. So I'm not picking on Islam here. It's a mindset. Okay, modernity, what's that? Is it contemporary flowers or churches? I mean, what part of modernity? Materialism. They, don't, they haven't just hated Christianity like wanting to wipe it out wherever they see. They've, they've, let, they've coexisted in Eastern Tibet, Muslims and Buddhists living together all, you know, for, for centuries and centuries. No problem. They're not killing each other. Muslims and Taoists living in China. No problem, you know. Not mass murder, you know, like they can't stand the sight. This is something recent. They can't stand modernity. The essence of modernity as they see it is materialism and they can't stand it. These 40% of Americans who believe, you know, just basically trash all of science. Why would they, I mean, there are, there are so many enlightened, I mean, modern, well-educated Christians, including a man who is like top person in the United States for the whole Genome Project, evangelical Christian. You know, brilliant scientist. James Clerk Maxwell, the most brilliant physicist between Newton and Einstein, evangelical Christian. And if you read this book, Huxley's Church and Maxwell's Demon. You say, whoa. The man who wins that debate is actually Maxwell. He was so much smarter. And what Huxley was, was dogmatic, bigoted, but was fantastic at propaganda. Maxwell was so, such a subtle thinker. I would follow him any other day, any day of the week, as opposed to Thomas Huxley, who was belligerent, arrogant, and militant, and a good scientist. And so one is a response to the other. The rise of fundamentalism is they're looking at science, they're seeing science totally wedded with materialism. They find materialism absolutely repugnant for very good reasons. And then they throw baby out with bathwater. They throw out materialism, they throw out science, they throw out modernity, and they wage war and cut the heads off of people. That's a bit simplistic what I just said, but not silly. There's a lot of truth there, I think. And so these two, these two forces, the rising of Scientific materialism with no grounding in ethics whatsoever, no grounding in any social responsibility, because it makes social moral responsibility makes no sense. It has no meaning if you're a materialist, because you are your brain, your brain operates according to chemistry and physics. There's no morality there. So let's not pretend. And they're on the rise. They're dominating the media, dominating academia, dominating science, dominating public policy, and that's in democracies let alone places like communist China, where people don't even see there's a choice, except for those who look and then they find it. These two, these two movements of scientific materialism and religious fundamentalism, I think both pose the greatest threat to humanity and the globe in the history of our planet. So call me melodramatic, but that's what I believe. And the solution for religious fundamentalism is come back to your roots of wisdom compassion of insight, because all these traditions have their own contemplative riches. Rediscover them. Rediscover them. And science, of course, has its riches. But throw off the burden of this terrible dogma that is so dehumanizing, demoralizing, and follow the best of science and discover, you know, what is the role of the observer? What's the role? What's the role? What is genuine happiness? So here we are, these little tiny cluster of people with unusual interests, you know. And I think what we are attending to here 
is of global significance. And in my meditation, I was imagining here around in the hillsides, uh, Filippo, the director of the Songhab Institute, was saying, Alan, I really hope the Castellina Marittima property works out for you. Totally supportive. You know, there's no competition with Songhab Institute at all. It's entirely complimentary. I really hope that works out. I think it will work out. But if it doesn't, <clears throat> I have some other properties I'd like to show you. <laughs> here in Toscana. And some woman who is you know, affiliated, she knows of my work. She and her mother own a beautiful property. She says, it's only half an hour away. Could you come and see it? We'd like you to... Would you like to purchase this? It could be a great contemplative observatory. You know, and I've told them all, oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Castellina Maritima is where my eyes are focused right now. I have to see whether that works out or not. But imagine, if you just like to have fun with me, this will be like one minute. Imagine. I'm so obviously Buddhist. I mean, I can run, but I cannot hide. <laughs> so you'd have to be kind of a really weird Christian to want to sit down and meditate under my guidance for two years. You know, because you don't know what my agenda is. Maybe I'm really, after all, trying to get you to become a nyingmapa. <laughs> no, the Christians should be guiding Christians. And the Sufis should be guiding Sufis. And the people 100% Hindus, they should be guiding Hindus. And so forth, right? Imagine the hills. The hills alive with contemplative observatories. Each one following its own tradition, impeccably, pure motivation. All of them learning shamatha, because they need that to deepen their own tradition. Right? That's all I'm saying. And breath isn't Buddhist, mind isn't Buddhist, awareness isn't Buddhist. Why is there any resistance? I don't think so. You know. But then them let them flower, like gardens of contemplative observatories sprinkled around Tuscany and the hills of Tuscany, Christian, Buddhist, and so forth. And then drawing from the scientists at the University of Scuola Superior di Sant'Anna in Pisa, and the University of Trento up in the northeast, maybe the University of Pisa, and then other universities around Europe. Scientists coming in, open-minded scientists coming in. Can we play too? <laughs> we have open minds. Can we learn together? Can we learn from each other about the nature of the mind, its potentials? And philosophers coming in. There's some outstanding philosophers. Michel Bitbol is excellent. French, I know him well. Oh, he's really good. I think he'd come. There's some other philosophers coming in. We'd like to turn our philosophy of mind into a phenomenological science of the mind. Can you help? We have our skills. You might be interested. And I am. Yeah, they've got a lot, so much insights there, but they've not been able to back it up with experience. So imagine full, like bees to a, to a flower, to a flower garden. Philosophers coming in, scientists from multiple disciplines, physics, neuroscience, psychology. Educators coming in. Do you have anything for our, kid, for our kids? You know, we could really use some help here. And then contemplatives coming in and creating their own communities. A garden of contemplative inquiry with full-fledged, open-hearted engagement with the scientists, philosophers, and society at large. Mudita. Enjoy your day. Thank you.